It's Apostle Terrell. Just want to share with you a moment. As I observe lives, I realize that a lot of people live lives that are diametrically opposed to the kingdom of God. They're usually lived by our culture. They're lived by our belief systems that were formed inside of us before we came to Christ. But Jesus says this, Jesus says, you'll know the truth and it's the truth that'll make you free. Truths that transform is centered in bringing transformation into the lives of believers by hearing the truths of God's word that maybe they haven't been articulated to you before or maybe you haven't understand them. We go through different seasons in our lives and sometimes there are things that we hear that we've heard but we never really heard them until all of a sudden the light is shown upon them. Truths of Transform is going to light up some things that you need to transform and build your life incredibly. So join me. It's going to be a great ride together. Take care. God bless you. Tune in. Peace. So the word the Lord dropped in my spirit this morning, well, not this morning, but through the week was the word relief. And so I looked up the meaning of the word relief and relief is a feeling of reassurance, a feeling of relaxation due to anxiety and distress. Let me say that again. Relief is a feeling of reassurance where we become reassured that things are going to be okay when there is anxiety and distress. It's a feeling of relaxation where we're able to exhale uh, because we know that even where there has been anxiety, which we've seen in our nation, where there's been distress, uh, there is relief through the things that we can employ from the kingdom of God. When we look at the condition of our present day, uh, we look at that and realize that the body of Christ uh, regarding what's going on must be those who are willing to forge forward. Let me say that again, because sometimes we get with non-believing friends or we get with, with uh, people who believe, but maybe they're not following out the principles of the kingdom. And they, they cause us to say things and be ways and, and do things that are outside of the order of the kingdom. Uh, but here's one thing that I know. The body of Christ has to take the leadership in the betterment of our of our nation. And as we talk about that, I just want to say that we can have arbitration. We can have treaties. There can be alliances. We can come through what we just came through with, with political elections. All of these things can can happen. And many of these things are the things that people place their hope in. Many people don't pay place their hope in Jesus Christ, and we cannot even believe that people around us are doing that. They're, they're looking at something else to be that which brings us into a place of settlement or brings us into a place of, of uh, moving beyond the differences that we have. All of those things may work, but they're only going to work temporarily. They're only going to affect us partially because we're de dealing with spiritual symptoms in people that have to be handled in spiritual matters. The relief of our nation longs for, again, the reassurance and the relaxation that can only come from the kingdom of God. And it can only come from those who are in this faultless kingdom. Yeah, the kingdom of God is a faultless kingdom. There's nothing wrong with it. There's nothing uh, uh, jacked up about it. There's nothing that is misaligned in it. There's nothing that is not productive in it. There's nothing that will not in it that will not change uh, the life and lifestyles of men and women. And so we have to begin to look to the kingdom. And as I said, we can have alliances and treaties and organizations and elections and all of these things, but they are not as strong as the faultless kingdom of our God. That deserves a praise right there. So let's look at Romans 14, verse 17. Romans 14, verse 17 records this. Paul writes, after all, the kingdom of God is not a matter of getting the food and drink one likes, but instead it's righteousness. That state, I'm talking about righteousness, that state which makes a person acceptable to God. So the kingdom of God is about righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Some of your Bibles may say the Holy Ghost, but the Holy Spirit. Now, as we read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we discover uh, Jesus more clearly. 
I tell a lot of people when you want to learn the life of Jesus, you want to know the nature and character of God, read the Gospels because it lays out what Jesus is like more clearly than where we see him in the other 62 books of the word, because he is in every book. But we clearly see him in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Well, the entrance of Jesus, and we see that in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Luke, and John more clearly, when he comes in, he establishes a new sovereignty, a new way that things should be done, carried out, handled. Why? Because he's carrying a government. He brings in a new government as a new king in the earth. While many didn't see him as king in the earth, from heaven's recording of him, he is the king and he's the king of kings. So his entrance is to come into the earth, but to come into the hearts of men and women to establish the kingdom of God inside of our hearts. As we talk about the heart, it's in that place where he rules in power and he rules in grace. And that's why we often say when we get saved, we give our heart to Jesus. Let Jesus come and live in your heart. Why? Because he's coming inside of us, the heart being the wellspring of all life. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And so with the heart being the wellspring of our life, Jesus comes in there by his spirit, bringing power and grace to rule our lives from our heart. That's why we ask for God to give us clean hearts so that our motives, our desires, our appetites are all pure and all aligned with that which is wholesome and that which is good. As we talk about the, the heart, it's a place that exists, or the kingdom of God, it's a place that exists for those who receive Jesus as Lord. It's a place where our lifestyles that originate in Jesus not only originate in him, but we distribute the ways of Jesus into the earth. That's what the kingdom of God does. Now, Paul says about this kingdom, Paul says that this kingdom is not in eating or drinking. As we look at Romans 14, 17, this kingdom is not in eating and drinking. In simplifying that statement, here's what Paul's communicating. Paul's communicating that the kingdom of God is not a kingdom where external visible things are a part of it. Yes, they are, but they're not the most vital principle of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God does not come in what we see and what we observe. The kingdom of God is that which is formed inside of us, in our hearts, by Jesus, by his spirit living inside of us. So Paul speaks to eating and he speaks to drinking because at that time in the Roman culture, these were things that were getting a lot of discussion from men and women who had converted from being non-believers into being believers and people who had moved from Judaism now into Christianity, there was a lot of talk and there was a lot of debate going on about what one eats and what one drinks and moons and stars and days and all these things. So because they were a heavy topic that were creating some restlessness among the people of God, Paul, as a father in the ministry, takes it upon himself to address these issues and to bring some level of clarity to them. And so he says, look, the kingdom of God is not in eating or in drinking, but the greater focus of the kingdom is righteousness. Then he says there's peace, say peace, and then joy in the Holy Spirit. But the kingdom pursuer, I'm talking about that man and woman who gives their life to Christ, but they're not complete, they're not satisfied just with salvation. Salvation is just like opening the door to a new home. It opens the door, but to step in is to step into the kingdom of God, to live, begin to live and carry out the mandates and the principles and the procedures, the policies, the ways of this government that God has given us. So for the kingdom pursuer, we don't demonstrate the kingdom by showing out works. That's not our most vital thing. But our main part of de demonstrating the kingdom is by obtaining the nature and the character of Jesus. It's more important to have the nature and character of Jesus and let that work out of you versus having works, but not having the nature and the character. So the kingdom focuses us on 
taking on the mind of Christ and carrying out his nature and carrying out his character and allowing that to flow out of our hearts, hear this, into the lives of other people and bring them into a place where righteousness is seen, but there's something about the peace of God that they begin to experience because the peace of God flows out of us. So look, let's look at the components of this scripture. Number one, righteousness. What is righteousness? We are living in the righteousness of Christ, which means that we aren't good enough to get ourselves in heaven. Many people believe that they're going to heaven because they're good. No, not one is good enough to get into heaven. The only way we get into heaven is through the righteousness of Christ, our big brother, and we inherit this righteousness as a believer, and that's what makes us acceptable to God. We can't do anything that is good enough to get us into heaven. That's why, as we talked about uh, Galatians 2.20 last week, that Paul says, I am crucified. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And so I'm in Christ, Christ is in me, and I've inherited that, but that's where my righteousness is. So the first component is righteousness. Then the second component is peace. What is peace? Peace is a mild and gentle demeanor. That's where I'm going to focus most of my conversation with you on today. And then there's joy, righteousness, peace, and joy. Joy being godly gladness that is in our heart. And all of this is by Holy Spirit, which is the presence and the power of God. And that presence and that power produces righteousness. Spirit-filled people produce righteousness. Spirit-filled people produce peace. Spirit-filled people produce joy. That's a lot of my concern, but that is the kingdom of God. And my concern is, why are we seeing the behavior that we're seeing out of men and women of God in this present culture that we in, we're in? Could it be that they're not filled with Holy Spirit? Could it be that we're grieving and ignoring and quenching Holy Spirit because we're not seeing the level of righteousness that we should? We're not seeing peace and we're not seeing joy come out of believers. Well, that's the kingdom of God. In reflection and observation, I conclude this. I conclude that the body of Christ has had its true heart revealed by God throughout February 2020 uh, up until this present time. I, I have a saying that I got from Apostle Charlene Glover, which says, when people show you who they are, believe them. When people show you who they are, believe them. And what I've seen of the body of Christ, it brings me to a place that I believe that we are very much devoid of the character and the nature of Christ as we move through these challenges that we've had in our society. I don't believe that we've been a light shining in darkness. I don't believe we've been a city on a hill. I don't believe that we've been a display of the mountain of God. For the most part, we've allowed an opportunity to reveal to the creature, as Romans 8 says, that waits in earnest expectation for us to be revealed, We've allowed that to slip by us. The opportunity to reveal to the creature what Jesus really looks like, many in the body of Christ, as I speak to the universal body, many in the body of Christ have missed that opportunity to show people what Jesus looks like in the midst of turmoil. But many of us have jumped right into the middle of the turmoil and believers in some cases have been bigger problems than the non-believers. As a matter of fact, the non-believer is doing what the non-believer does, and that's to act heathenistic and sinful. But to see the body of Christ behave like it's behaved, to have the statements that it's making, to be saying the things and doing the things that it's doing in the way that it's doing. There's a way that seems right, but the way we've been doing them is where many of the challenges come that has kept the creature from seeing us. We've shown mostly lives and hearts that have not been discipled unto Jesus Christ, but we're showing lives and hearts that have been uh, discipled unto preferences, preferences based on societal status. Uh, based on ethnicity. I don't use the word race because it's not a word that God uses, but ethnicity. Uh, we, we, we've seen preferences based on political 
preferences and economics and and even religion. This is what our bend has been in these days, but our bend has not been to demonstrate to people that look like Jesus. We've contributed to the anxiety of the culture. I believe we've contributed to the stress of the culture as opposed to being the demonstrations of Jesus. I've been amazed at these things. I've, I've been amazed at the lovelessness of the body of Christ. I've been amazed at the agitation of the body of Christ, for we've agitated other believers. We've agitated non-believers. I've been amazed at the idolatry that we've placed in blackness, the idolatry we've placed in whiteness, the idolatry we've placed in Trump, the idolatry we've placed in, in Biden, the idolatry we've placed in Democrat and Republican, the idolatry we've placed in our jobs and businesses and, and money and, and places we could go and be, all of these things that we discovered that many of us have worshiped toward those things and not to worship by God. I've, I've been amazed at, at the confrontational nature that I've seen from those who call themselves the Lord's. See, I, I, I trip because from the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, Jesus says this, Matthew 5, 19, Jesus says, blessed, meaning enjoying. When people are blessed, they're enjoyable or they enjoy life. But he says, blessed, enjoying, uh, enviable, happiness, spiritually prosperous with a joy, with a life joy and satisfaction in God's favor, salvation, regardless of their outward condition. He calls this blessed. He says, blessed are people who are enjoying life, who are not enviable, people who have happiness, people who are spiritually prosperous, people who are living lives satisfied with God, moving in God's favor, moving in salvation, regardless of what is going on around them. He says, blessed are the makers and the maintainers of peace. He says, these are the people who are blessed. This is what I'm speaking to this morning, as I said, that peace would be the main component of the kingdom that the Lord would have me to speak to because it's that peace that's going to bring the relief, the reassurance and the relaxation that comes as we've been through anxiety and stressful situations. And God says, blessed are the makers of peace and blessed are the maintainers of peace. That this is who the body of Christ should be because the kingdom of God is inside of us. This is what we should be doing. We should be looking for opportunities to make peace. We should be looking for opportunities to maintain peace for they shall be called the sons of God. That's what Matthew 5, 9 says. People who make peace and people who maintain peace, God says, I call you sons of God. Now, all these believers out here that are antagonizing and being uh, uh, confrontational in unhealthy ways and that are just spewing out and spouting out and writing and speaking and saying, and I know it's your, your Facebook page and I know it's your Instagram and I know it's all that, but we still have a responsibility to the kingdom of God. I don't belong to a party. I belong to the kingdom of God. And in belonging to the kingdom of God, I should be one who makes peace who has words that come out of my mouth in a way that they come out of my mouth and demonstrations that come out of my life and my heart in a way that when they come out of my life and heart, they're full with peace. They bring people into a place of relaxation. They bring people into a place of reassurance that I can relax in Jesus. I can rest in Jesus. What that person is saying or writing, what they're communicating, that sounds like something I can get with because it's taking on the place of peace. Even though they may be upset, even though they may be angry, even though they may bother and frustrated, that which they are feeling is not that which comes out of them because peace overrides those other things in them. And so whatever they deliver it's coming in peace. Paul sums this up and wraps it up in Romans 12, 8, 18, declaring this. In Romans 8, 18, 12, 18, he declares this. If possible, and this is what I say to the body of Christ, because I'm telling you, we got to get on board and we have to be light shining in darkness. We've got to be the true points of difference. 
We have to make it matter that we go to church, read the word of God, fast and pray. We've got to make it matter that we move by the fruit of the spirit, that we've got access to every supernatural endowment that would allow us to be that which people would desire. So Paul says this in Romans 18, declaring that if possible, he says, if, if possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. <laughs> live at peace with everyone. Now, now hear this, because here, here's somebody's deliverance where peace is lacking in your life. Here's your deliverance. The inability to live in peace or offer peace to others is according to one's own uh, absence of baseness. The inability to live in peace or the inability to offer peace. You're in your home, you're in your business, you're your coworkers, you're your neighbors, you're with people of a, of a different ethnicity, of a different gender, but you find yourself inability to live at peace with people. You're the teenager in the house and you can't live at peace with people. You're, you're the mom, you're the dad, you're the married couple, but you can't have peace in the house. The inability to live in peace or offer peace to other is according to your own absence of character and purity, which the body of Christ and many of us have been found guilty of over this last year, especially from June 2020 until now. This inability to live in peace and this inability to, to offer peace is really showing people where you are. Because if you don't have peace, you can't give peace. And many of us have been unraveled in this season. We've been stirred up in this season. Many of us have become distressed, oppressed, frustrated, upset, mean, angry, bothered, fearful, doubtful, hopeless. And that's what's coming out of us. We don't have peace. And so as these things continue to hit our society and build from one incident to the next incident, all the way to what happened at Capitol Hill, those were people who didn't have peace. Those were people who believed that, that, that what they wanted was not going to come to pass and what they believed is going to come. They didn't want it, so they had no peace. But it wasn't that they didn't have peace about that. It wasn't that many of you didn't have peace about a particular thing. It's that you haven't had peace at all. And because I haven't had peace at all, I get stirred up real quick. I become angry real quick because I don't have peace in me. We have to be mindful as kingdom people. I'm talking to the church. I'm not talking to people who just want to shout and jump and run and, and all that stuff that we do and call ourselves the church. And we have an impact in society at all. Those things are good. Those things are noble. They're good to do. God tells us to do them. But when we quit shouting, what do we look like and act like and sound like? And when we get dancing and twirling and all the things that we're doing and prophesying and all that, what do we really look like? That's what matters. It's not the outworks. It's the character and the nature inside of our heart. And my focus today is peace. Is peace there? We've got to be mindful in these times, but always that the kingdom of God is a kingdom of peace. It's a kingdom of peace. Isaiah 9 says this, the sixth verse. You've heard me quote it before. Note it and you can go back and study it. It says, for to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government, talking about God's government, shall be upon his shoulders. This is Isaiah in Isaiah 9 prophesying the coming of Jesus, okay? He's saying, for a child is born, a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father of Eternity. And look at the last name, Prince of Peace, my father who art in heaven is a prince of peace. My Lord and Savior who died for me is Jesus Christ. He's the prince of peace. My big brother in righteousness is the prince of peace. Therefore, if the father is the prince of peace and the son is the prince of peace and the Holy Spirit is the prince of peace. And because the spirit lives in me and because I am a follower of Christ, then guess what? I am that which peace should be demonstrative from. I should be a walking peace machine. Carriers of peace, here's what they look like. When you carry peace, you shun animosity. When you carry peace, you shun antagonism. You shun hostilities. You shun hate. I'm stretching you this morning in the Holy Ghost. You, you, you carry uh, 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 no contention. 
carries a, a, a peace don't carry warfare toward people and places and things to pull them down, to destroy them, to hurt them, to speak things about them that are not good and kind and not for their betterment. The carriers of peace shun all of those things. They shun those things. See, there's so much unrest in our nation right now. And, and, and here's what's happening, because you've got to see the way that, that the wiles of the devil works. Jesus says, in this world, you will have tribulation. Tribulation is an opportunity to see the glory of God come to pair. But he says, be of good cheer because I've overcome the world. But there's another side of tribulation that the adversary tries to capitalize on as well. And that's what's happening mostly in our nation, because as tribulation comes, the, the, the spirit of the Antichrist, the spirit, I, I was talking to a, a, a son the other day and he said, I don't believe in the devil. I said, well, the devil is real. He said, I believe in the enemy. You can call him whatever you want, but he's still the devil. Okay. Now, now hear this, hear this. Tribulation looks to assert itself in wrath and an outburst of wrath. Jesus says on one side, in this world, you'll have tribulation, be of good cheer, I've overcome it. The adversary on the other side says, I'm going to take this tribulation and I'm going to make this tribulation work so that people begin to be filled with wrath and people begin, begin to have outbursts of wrath. I'm going to make tribulation something that works for me, not that works for the good to those who love God, the called according to the purpose. I'm going to influence those who love God and are called according to his purposes, I, and they want things to work for the good of them. I'm going to make tribulation work to the bad of them and cause them to become angry and cause the nation and the believers in the name. I'm talking to the church. I ain't talking to the world this morning. And, 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 and I'm talking to the church and cause those who are, are, are believers in God because of tribulation to become arrogant and to become impatient. And this is the thing that I'm seeing the most. And some of you thought I was off my rocker because of my comments before the message last, last week. But we're seeing people become mercilessness. Oh, I, I said that wrong. Mercilessness. We're seeing people become not merciful, but mercilessness. We're seeing mercilessness. We're seeing a, 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 a council culture. We're seeing people trying to ruin people's lives. We're seeing believers coming against one another, trying to pull down, trying to destroy, trying to disrupt, trying to make others' lives bad, saying and doing things, representing things, things coming out of our being that have no redemptive value, but they're just an opportunity for us to do what we want to do because we have a platform. But all this is coming out of tribulation. And when we don't take God's peace into our circumstances, if we don't take God's uh, peace into our situations that we encounter and are encountering, we gain ground in a way that we, I'm sorry, we, we, we don't gain ground in ways that are going to see the beauty and the glory of God. But when we allow tribulation to gain ground, then unrest comes into our nation and many of us in the body are partaking in this unrest. But Paul says this to us in Romans 12, 21. Note that down. He says this in Romans 12, 21. He says, do not let yourself be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. The truth of the Lord endures to all generations. The truth of the Lord makes us free. The truth of the Lord is unchanging. What needed to be said to the Christian culture in Rome's, in Roman, still needs to be said to us today. Do not let yourself be overcome by evil that we see and hear about and reports we get. Don't get, you're in the kingdom of God. You don't get worked up about election results. You don't get worked up and overtaken by a Democrat or a Republican party. You don't get worked up by unrest in the streets and join yourself to unrest in, in, in the streets with, without a true motive of bringing hope and life and peace and joy and even salvation to those that are, that are in the streets. I mean, if we're going to be there, let's be there as a light shining in darkness and not an observer. 
but don't overcome the evil that we see going on in places and that we hear or that it's reported that it's going on. We don't try to overcome that evil with evil, but we overcome, and I like the way he puts it, we master evil with good. What happens when the body of Christ universally begins to seek through these times right now to master evil with good? See, see, media is setting uh, uh, people against people. That's why you've got to have a clear balance on watching what you watch and listening to what you hear, because one side can have you not knowing the truth and one side can have you not knowing the truth. You've got to hear both sides of all things because there's truth in both sides, but you've got to find the truth and then apply the word of God to it so that you are mastering the evil that is intended by all media sources by high tech, by all of these platforms that are out there that are pushing their agenda and the body of Christ can't jump in an agenda, we've got to jump on our faces and on our knees and into the face of God and discover what God wants. The result when all of this happens that we don't allow evil that we see to be matched with evil that comes out of us, the result is relief and that relief comes through peace. When we have peace within us, what happens? We respond peacefully to evil. That's why we're gonna redeem time this year and be discipled unto Jesus because all of the evil that we see work toward Jesus, he responded in what? Peace. His people were, un were under assault, but he responded in peace. His ways were not accepted by everybody, but he responded in peace. Not everybody agreed with him, but he responded in peace because he did not allow the evil that was coming out him or the evil that was in society that could have an impact, impact on him. He didn't match that evil with evil, but he brought good to it. And when we have peace within us, we respond peacefully to evil. That's how Jesus was able to do it. I don't want to be right. I want to be peaceful. I don't want to be wrong. I just want to be peaceful. I don't want to be second. Yeah, I just want to be peaceful. I don't want to tear people down. I just want to be peaceful. We have to, to, to make this peace a part of our active life in these times. Why? Because people are looking to the body of Christ to be the antidote, and they're waiting to hear what we have to say and how we say it. The body of Christ's response to civil unrest and political hopes and outcomes and economic downturn has been far from peaceful. And our light is dim and those who need to see Jesus through us are not seeing it. So let's do this. As the body of Christ, as kingdom ambassadors, as an apostolic community, as apostolic believers, let's sheer ourselves up. Let, let, let's sheer ourselves up. That, that what I represented uh, last week, I'm not representing that this week. I'm representing something greater, something stronger, something better. And you might have represented all good things, but, but we're going to get gooder this week because we understand that we've got a God to glorify, not a mindset that we carry to be glorified unless that mindset is the mindset of Christ. So as body of Christ and ambassadors, let's sure ourselves up. Number one, look at Hebrews 12, verse 14. Hebrews 12, verse 14. Hebrews 12, verse 14. Now, this is what the writer says. I believe Paul's the writer of Hebrews. He says this. He says, strive to live in peace with just the people who the same color as you. Strive to live in peace with just the people who look like you, sound like you, believe what you believe. Just strive with the people who are in the same socioeconomic uh, rank as you are. No, no. He says strive to live in peace with everybody. Now, now somebody put in the chat what the definition of everybody is. It's probably going to come out to mean everybody. Strive to live in peace with everybody and pursue that consecration <laughs> and pursue that holiness without which no one will see the Lord. He's saying clearly that you're not going to see God if you're not striving to live in peace with people because he is the Prince of Peace. So he expects us to live in peace, not to be antagonizing, not to be confrontational in an unhealthy way. He expects us to be peaceful. 
And he's saying that this is how you see God. This is how you experience God. This is how you come into the place of God is to pursue consecration into a life of peace. I'm consecrating myself to peace. I'm moving myself into a measure of holiness that is even centered in living peaceful. Look at Psalm 34, 14. It'll be on the screen. You can write it down for your notes. Uh, the writer in Psalms writes this in the 14th verse of the 34th chapter. He says, depart from evil and do good. Depart from evil and do good. The opposite of good is evil. I'm not calling you evil, but all of us do evil stuff. The opposite of good is wicked. I'm not calling you wicked, but all of us do wicked stuff. Okay? The opposite of good is lawless. I'm not calling you lawless, but all of us do lawless stuff. God is saying us, depart from evil. We've got a world that is going crazy out here. Evil is being planned. Evil is being plotted. Evil is being spoken. Evil is being agreed to. Evil is being in, uh, 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 inserted into our spirits, into our hearts, into our soul. And he's saying we got to depart from evil and do good. Seek and inquire for and crave peace. That, that's one reason I lost 31 pounds. I quit craving Little Debbie oatmeal cakes at 11 o'clock at night. I craved them, but now I crave peace. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Depart from evil and do good. Seek and inquire for and crave peace. Long for peace. Go after peace. Want peace. Go down the hall and create peace between you and the child that y'all ain't spoke in three days. Bring peace with you and your spouse that y'all just ain't connecting right now. Crave peace and pursue it. Go after it, God says. You go after it. You go. You be the one that brings the peace to the coworker you've been disagreeing with. You be the one that brings peace between you and your friend that you snapped at because they had a different political belief than you did. You be the one that craves after peace and pursues peace and carries that peace out. I'm speaking the kingdom of God this morning. First Peter 3.11 says this. First Peter 3.11. Let him turn away from wickedness and shun it and let him do right. Okay. Let him search for peace, which means harmony, undisturbedness from fears, uh, agitating passions, moral conflicts. Let him search for peace. So that so that you you have an undisturbedness from fears, an undisturbedness from agitating passions. You're not disturbed by moral conflicts because you've got peace in you. Remember what I was saying earlier that 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 many of us are not being peaceful because we don't have peace inside of us. We've been traumatized by things. We've been offended. We've been rejected. We've been hurt. We've been confused. We've been left alone. We don't know what to do, how to do it, where to do it, when to do it. We don't know who we can trust. And all of these things keep us from having peace. Many of us are concerned about our jobs, our homes, our children's education and all this. So we don't have peace. But God is saying, you've got to search for peace. You've got to go look for peace. Where can I find peace in that? Hear, the, hear me, hear it. Peace in that which is good, which is noble, which is righteous which is holy, because you can go and find a, 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 a imitation peace, but I'm talking about true peace. That's why I wanted to qualify that a little bit. But you've got to go search for it. And not only does he say search for it, Peter tells us to seek it eagerly. Seek peace eagerly. Why? Because I need peace working in me so that I can give peace away. Do not merely desire peaceful relations with God, with your fellow man, and with yourself, but pursue and go after. Don't just say, yeah, that peace that Apostle's talking about, I, yeah, I want that to happen. No, he's saying go after it. You go make it happen. You go make it happen at the grocery store. You listen to the conversations and get them, and you bring peace at the at, at the gym. You bring peace in the restaurant. You bring peace in your comings and goings, in your conversations, in your online chat. You bring peace. Because why? I'm in the kingdom of God, and it's under the prince of peace. And so for me to conform to the ways of this kingdom, then I've got to conform to the one who is peaceful. He's my prince of peace. Therefore, peace should come out of me. Romans 14, 19 says, so let us then definitely aim for and eagerly pursue what makes for harmony. My God, my goodness, 
how many opportunities have God has God given us, especially since June, and we had the the unrest in in the streets because of social injustice. How how many times has God given us opportunities to eagerly pursue what makes harmony in all of this? turmoil and chaos that is going on? What what makes for the mutual upbuilding? What makes for edification and development of one another? This is what God wants from us. This is the posture we take. Well, I don't know what to do in these times. I'm showing you what to do. I'm giving it to you. And there's a grace that's coming with it that you can carry it out. And there's a joy of the Lord that will be with you in the Holy Spirit because of the righteousness that you're demonstrating because you don't choose to take sides. You choose to be in the army of the Lord to, 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 to be centered in what God thinks and what God is saying right now in the earth that if my people who would call by my name, would humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven, forgive their sin and do what, Lord? He says, I'll heal the land. And people always talk about, oh, our nation needs healing right now. But then people on that side, they're just a pain in the butt. Oh, our nation needs healing right now. But that president we've got is just as, oh, our people need need healing right now. Yeah, but you see the black people, the white people, the Asian people, the Mexican people, all that they're doing and how they're carrying on an act. Oh, but we need peace right now. We can't have peace right now if we're not eagerly pursuing harmony, which begins inside of me. And then lastly, in John 14, 27, we read words that all of us know and have heard from Jesus. He says in John 14, 27, we're going to wrap it up. He says, peace, I leave with you. My own peace, I now give and bequeath to you. Find someone you can bequeath peace to. (laughs) Not as the world gives, do I give to you. Even in peace, the peace the world's talking about ain't the same peace that Jesus is talking about. So so not as the world gives, do I give to you, no. And then he goes on to say, do not let your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Stop allowing yourself, he says, to be agitated. Stop allowing yourself to be disturbed. Stop allowing yourself. One of the fruit of the spirit is self-control. Paul said, I punish my body. I I make it my slave, basically so it's going to do what I dictate to it to do, not what it wants to do. My emotions are under my rule. They're not under the rule of my soul. My spirit man rules my emotions. So I don't get agitated. I don't get disturbed. Why? Because I'm filled with peace. And he goes on to say, don't permit yourselves to be fearful and intimidated and cowardly and unsettled. You know why there's so much a lack of peace in the earth today and people are warring and fighting and going back and forth over these matters like they are? Because of fear. Fear makes you do all kinds of things. Fear makes you act all kinds of ways. Fears makes you take on all types of dispositions, causes you to move in attitudes and behaviors. Fear causes much of the unrest that we see because I don't know how things are going to turn out. Why did people storm Capitol Hill? Because of the fear that they were not going to be heard as a voice because of fear of a new party taking over and it caused them to act like they acted. And I'm not saying that they were right, but can we have some understanding of what they did and be merciful towards them and be, instead of being mercilessness? Because if people were to talk about how you acted when you run into things that cause you to fear, you could be considered one that gets a little rowdy, a little chaotic, a little bothered as well. Fear creates emotions and mindsets and outcomes that keep us from demonstrating God. For the spirit field, this should be our consciousness. Our consciousness should be this, that peace, which is a mild and gentle demeanor, peace, which is the absence of hostilities, has been given to us. Peace has been given us. This has to be our consciousness. Jesus says, my peace I leave to you. Now, if I don't take that peace every day, if I don't bring that peace into my life every day, if I don't stir that peace up, if I'm not conscious of the peace that I already have, if I'm not working to keep peace working in me against everything that comes against me, then I can, I can think I don't have peace. But he's given me peace, but he's given me peace so it can be given. He's given me peace 
so it can be given. Jesus brought to us what he would, what we should bring to the world. Everything, every endowment that Jesus put in our lives by the Holy Spirit, it's that we would put them into the world by working in agreement with Holy Spirit. Our words, our expressions, but all of this begins with peace in me. That's where it begins. That's one thing I miss about our time together. That's one attack of COVID on the body of Christ is our ability to, to embrace one another and pass the peace. And you'd often hear me say, if you ain't got peace, you can't pass peace. But you're going to pass on to somebody everything you feeling, everything you're going through, up everything you up against, you're going to pass it on. But, but he's saying, look, he said, my peace I give with you. Here's the question. Am I at peace? Am I at peace? Am, am I really at peace? Because if I am, then my words, thoughts, deeds will show it. My actions will show it. The way things are said will, will show it. Someone told me, I can tell you're disturbed right now. I am disturbed. I'm disturbed at the body of Christ right now. And I have a right to be disturbed at the body of Christ right now. Because we are not representing what the peace of God and the nature and the character of Jesus should look like. Now, I want to help you in this peace search. Traditional thinking is this, and, and this is going to set you free. Here's traditional thinking. Traditional thinking is we generally want peace in a matter, but we don't want peace to carry and give away. Most of us, when we pursue peace, we want peace to make us feel better or feel okay in the thing that we're dealing with. And that's as far as we take peace. We don't take peace beyond ourselves. Jesus says, my peace I leave to you. My peace I give to you. His intention was that everything that he gave us to be given away. But most of us stop at peace as a matter of self-medication, as a matter of self-enhancement, as a matter of self-edification, as a matter of exhaling. Now I have peace, but we forget that the peace that we get is to be carried. I'm to, to walk around with peace, looking for places where I can deposit it. That's the level of peace that God wants us walking to. That's the kingdom of God. Peace received as an antidote to bring the nature and the glory and the kingdom of God to bear on matters that we long for, especially in these times. The world needs the peace of God to be showered on it. Men's hearts, women's hearts, families, businesses, governments, all need the peace of God to be poured out on us, and we pour that peace out on others that we engage. That's the kingdom of God. So my accountability and my responsibility to this nation as a believer because God put me in the nation. God put you in the nation. God put you in the earth. And he said, steward it. He said, subdue it. He, he said, handle it. Make it better. Improve it. Enhance it. When he put Adam in the garden, he put Adam in the garden to make the garden better. God put you in the earth to make the earth better. So therefore, my accountability and my responsibility to God, certainly, but to this nation, is that we should shepherd this nation. We should be the pastors for this nation. I know the Spirit of the Lord is saying this in our hearts this morning. We should be the shepherds, the pastors of this nation. You're the pastor of your subdivision. You should be the pastor of your complex. You should be the pastor of your work group, your workstation. You should be the pastor among the moms on that soccer team or that basketball team or that football team or the volleyball team. You're the pastor. But what we've allowed the pastoring to come from has been the media and they're bad pastors. They're wicked pastors. They're evil pastors. They're pastors full of agendas to divide people. They're not good pastors. That's why Jesus said of the scribes and the Pharisees, don't call them father because they're not good fathers. We've allowed the fathering of this nation to be left to media and politicians and special interests and high tech. And these aren't good fathers. These aren't good shepherds. But we should be 
shepherding the nation, the world, the areas that God has given us to go to and fro in. And our shepherding is to obtain peace in our lives and then live diligently to distribute that peace wherever we encounter anybody or anything that doesn't look like God. Father, we we yield to you this morning. We thank you for your truth. We thank you for your word. We thank you that peace is upon us, that peace is present with us. We thank you that when Jesus died at Calvary and when we confessed him as Lord and the spirit came to live inside of us, he brought the Prince of Peace to be in us. Father, show us how the Prince of Peace lives. Show us how the Prince of Peace handles matters. Show us how the Prince of Peace can move a nation of people in turmoil and chaos and, and differences and hatred and, and, and anger, God. We need peace. Father, I joined my prayer, prayer with Minister Roderick's prayer this morning for peace, that peace would come like a river, God, and overflow its boundaries, its banks, where we block peace out of our lives and out of this nation. Let it pour over the banks. Let it pour over those blockages and let peace like a river flow. Let it be a forceful, powerful river that enters into the lives of those who are called by you, God, the chosen, the set apart, the men and women of the kingdom of God, a kingdom that is in righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Let that peace that Jesus gave us be carried out. God, grace us with courage and boldness and love to give peace away. Give us the words that, that come out, that, that, that communicate peace. Give us the actions and the deeds that come out that communicate peace. Grace us to do peaceful things today, Lord, peaceful things tomorrow. Grace us to speak peaceful things, post peaceful things. Engage people with a peaceful demeanor, with smiles, with, with encouragement, with winks of the eye, God, with, with nodding of the head, whatever we can do that says, I'm an instrument of peace. Father, let that flow out of us, God. You've not made us as men and women of anger and hostility and contention and antagonism. You've not made us to be people who war when we shouldn't war but you've made us to carry peace, God. Even in the middle of Peter of, of Peter taking the Roman soldier's ear off, Jesus still moved in peace, told them what kind of war he could bring, but he bought peace. Father, let the peace of Jesus be the peace that yields, that we yield to and be the peace that attaches itself to our hearts, God. Purge us. Let the water of the words of these scriptures that I've read, let that water, that word wash us. Let it wash away hostility. Let it wash away anger. Let it wash away meanness, God. And let peace cover our nation and let peace flow, God. Let peace be obtained. Let peace be pursued. Let us eagerly go after peace and let us obtain it, God not by power nor might, but by your spirit. Your peace, your word says, you lead to us, your peace again, God. You give to us through your word. Let us take your peace and let us carry it out and let us move in your glory and let us bring your glory and your nature and your character to bear on this nation. We fight not this word, God, but we receive it into ourselves and we don't justify from me down anything that we've done that has been peaceless. We don't justify it, God. We own up to it. We repent of it. We turn away from it. And we say, God, bring peace through me. Oh, shabbat For your nation. In Jesus' name we pray and call these things done and so. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. And your kingdom is a kingdom of peace. Prince of peace, we yield to you and declare your demonstrations. First of all, your reality in our heart and your demonstrations out of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. God bless you. I love you. The peace of God be with you. Peace of God flow out of you. Take care. God bless you. I'm out. Apostle Terrell, peace.